Okay, welcome back. This is part two of the black hole lesson for Friday, March 20th, 2020. Digital learning day five already, a uh, full week. So anyway, just getting right back to it, I'm going to turn my present mode back on. And we'll pull up the PowerPoint once more. And again, we, we left off on part one with, uh, let me get all these things right away here. Anyway, we left off, we were just about to get into talking about reclassification of black holes. And so that's that's where we're picking up. Again, we're going to focus on two different ways to classify black holes. And please keep in mind that, again, what we talk about in this class, especially when it comes to this really complex stuff, is kind of a basic level or introductory level presentation of this information. So there are more than just two ways to classify black holes. And there's also sometimes more classifications or classes than we're going to talk about. For example, um, black holes can can either have or not have electrical charge. We're, we're not really going to worry about that because it doesn't really have, it's not, it's not going to be tremendously helpful additional information. Um, but what we are going to focus on is classifying black holes by two things, like I said, rotation, firstly, and then mass. And so we'll just hop right into it. So Again, the most basic black hole that we can think of is a theoretical black hole. And it's a it's what we call a non-rotating black hole, or the more proper term is the Schwarzschild black hole. It's named after Carl Schwarzschild. Again, we, we brought up that name in the previous lesson, part one, when we were talking about calculating the Schwarzschild radius. There, these Both of these you know, terms are named for Carl Schwarzschild. And again, you'll, um, you'll learn more about him in the, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, black hole apocalypse video. Um, it, it gets into a little bit of his history and so forth. So anyway, um, as stated, such a black hole would not be rotating. It's called a non-rotating black hole. And since all black holes should conserve their, the angular momentum of their progenitor stars, again, if, if this black hole started off as a red supergiant, that red supergiant is spinning even as it goes into a supernova type two explosion. And so that means that the black hole formed from that explosion should also conserve that angular momentum. And in fact, it should rotate faster than the star should because its radius has decreased tremendously. And that also means that these non-rotating black holes, this simplified Schwarzschild black hole, probably they don't exist. You, you probably can't actually go anywhere in nature in the universe and find just a really, really, really simple Schwarzschild type black hole like this because most of them probably are rotating. And we'll get to those in a, in a minute. Um, but they are very, this, this model of a black hole is very useful for discussing, you know, just kind of the basics and entry level discussion of black holes. But they have only three parts. And we've already talked about two of these parts. We've talked about singularities. We've talked about event horizons. Nothing really new to say about those right now with a short shield black hole. They kind of behave like we've already been talking about in part one. What is new that we didn't really talk about so far is something called a photon sphere. Now, again, notice how I said that photon sphere. And let me um, turn my, my laser pointer here, right here. Photon sphere. Two separate words. This is not the same as the photosphere of a star. We talked about photospheres, uh, like the photosphere of the sun, its surface. This is not that. This is a different term, and it has you know it's nothing to do with regular stars. It's all about black holes. And the photon sphere of a black hole, um, it's a distance, which happens to be, by the way, one and a half times the distance of the Schwarzschild radius from the center. And so you, you can see in the diagram here, um, this is probably not to scale, but if the Schwarzschild radius is one times the Schwarzschild radius, then the photon sphere should be 1.5 times that distance from the singularity. So anyway, what happens at the photon sphere, it's, it's just, it happens to be, it's kind of like a Lagrangian point between two binary stars. It's a point where the gravity of the singularity of the black hole is going to be almost perfectly balanced to keep a wave or photon of light just kind of trapped around the black hole. It'll just keep orbiting the black hole like pretty much forever. And, you know, the, this has been more visually depicted in recent years because it's been the, the, you know, this sort of typical image of a black hole you see these days. This is kind of a new thing, a relatively new thing. It was popularized again a few years ago with 2014's Interstellar film. Um, before that, most, most folks who were coming up with uh, visual depictions of black holes didn't really include this ring 
of light around the black hole. And that's more or less supposed to be showing what the photon sphere is. What's kind of neat about the photon sphere is that because it's light going in a circle around and around again, is that if you were to travel near a black hole and situate yourself at the photon sphere and then look in a direction that was perpendicular to the singularity, so like looking off to the side, not looking directly at the black hole, if you were to do that, you would actually be able to see the back of your head because the light reflecting off of the back of your head would be traveling in this circular orbit and eventually reach back around and hit your face. And then if you had some, you know, if you literally had eyes on the back of your head, you'd be able to see your face from behind. So it's weird, weird stuff, but really cool stuff. And um, it's, to me, it's one of the more interesting things about black holes. A lot of people, a lot of people at least don't know the term. Um, but again, it, thanks to interstellar, the visual aspect of the photon sphere is at least kind of well known at this point. And again, here's just a nice pretty diagram that I was able to find. And it shows again, kind of this, this has more of a thinner photon sphere being depicted, but that's fine. Again, these are all artistic depi depictions. Um, and they, this tells you a little bit more about some of these parts. Now, all of this extra stuff, like the accretion disk and the relativistic jets, those are things that might be present on a black hole, but might not be. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later here in part two. All right, so like we said, it's not really likely at all that a black hole would be able to sit still and not spin or not rotate because of the conservation of angular momentum from the star that they form out of. So instead, we also have this model for rotating black holes because, again, if well, if that's what's more likely to occur, we should probably you know talk about what that would be like. And it's named after an astrophysicist with the last name Kerr, so it's called a Kerr black hole instead of a, a Schwarzschild black hole. And the rotation, unfortunately, for us as uh, students of astronomy, it complicates the structure of the black hole, it makes things just a lot more parts and a lot more kind of weirdness going on here. Now, the outermost part is kind of simple, um, and, and this is simply to say that instead of a single photon sphere, we kind of end up with two. And actually, you can find some models of Kerr, I'm sorry, of uh, Schwarzschild black holes that also have two photon spheres, um, but I kind of kept it as at one for the simplicity of the previous example. So anyway, with a, with a Kerr black hole, with a rotating black hole, you will for sure end up with two photon spheres. Um, and they're called the co-rotating and counter-rotating photon spheres. The counter-rotating photon sphere is the outermost photon sphere, and that's where all of the light would be rotating around the black hole, but in the opposite direction of the black hole's rotation. And then further in, a little bit closer to the black hole, then you get another photon sphere, which is the co-rotating sphere, where all of the light is rotating in the same direction with the black hole. So you have these two photon spheres. Both of them, again, trap the light within them, um, again, it's just that we have two layers, and again, they move in opposite directions. Now, this next term is a is kind of a cool term. It's called the ergosphere or ergosphere. And if you've never seen a word that has erg or ergo with as like a prefix or a word root, erg means to work. It's a Greek root. And um, so the ergosphere, the reason why it's called that is because this is, if you approach the ergosphere, which by the way, like it says here, the, the boundary of the ergosphere is also called the static limit. Um, static here in the sense of um, stasis, like not moving, not static like static electricity. But if you enter the ergosphere, that is where the black hole starts to actually do motionary. That, I don't think that's a, a word. It starts to do movement based work on space time around it. So you will actually, it's like a whirlpool almost, uh, the water around a whirlpool in the ocean or something. So the water around a whirlpool is spinning around and around like in a vortex. The ergosphere is kind of like that, but it's the, the space time itself in the ergosphere is already starting to move and rotate with the black hole itself. So you're not, it's still a point of return. It's not the point of no return that the event horizon provides for us. But you start experiencing pretty serious relativistic effects within this ergosphere. And again, the static limit is its boundary. And if you'll notice, it also has sort of a complex structure. It's got sort of almost like a butterfly uh, bilobed appearance. It's not a single circle or ellipse or sphere. It's got these sort of two lobes to it. All right. Uh, next couple of parts here. We have two event horizons. So, yeah, in actuality, most black holes most likely really have two event horizons, not just one. And the outer event horizon is, 
more like the typical event horizon we've been talking about. And um, this is the area in which freedom of spatial movement or movement through space is allowed, but no freedom of temporal movement or movement through time is allowed. And honestly, if you really stop and think about what that statement is saying, it's that sounds kind of like normal existence. We move through space freely, but we're strictly locked in moving forward through time. So that kind of sounds like normal existence. Um, of course, a pretty big difference here is that you're not getting out of this area. So yes, you can move around freely through space, but only within the bounds of the, um, the, uh, within the event horizon, excuse me. Now the inner event horizon does some weird stuff. It kind of, it's, first of all, it's, it's got another name. It's also called the Cauchy horizon. And if you cross this horizon, you get sort of an inversal or a reversal, I guess, of the roles of space and time, which again, if you notice here, I just say, what? Like, what does that mean to reverse the roles of space and time? That's, a, that's kind of a dumb statement. Um, but basically it, it means that you no longer have freedom of spatial movement. Once you have crossed the Cauchy horizon, you are moving toward the singularity. Any movement just gets you there, kind of like quicksand. You've ever seen a movie with the uh, typical quicksand scene in it? The more the people move and struggle, the further they sink into the sand. That's kind of what's going on here. Um, except that, again, instead of just thinking and saying, you're going toward this singularity. Um, there's apparently some freedom of temporal or time-based movement within the, the Cauchy horizon. I don't really know exactly how that plays out. And a lot of other people who study this stuff, they don't really know either. However, um, a, a really great YouTube channel that we've used at least once or twice before, um, last fall, I know we watched a video on Pluto, for example, if you look at PBS Space Time, Matt O'Dowd is their main host, at least in the past few years. And he's got a great video on this. That's what this link shows. So if you pull this up on the actual regular PowerPoint, uh, you can access it. And it'll give you a lot more of the gory details of all this stuff than we're really you know, looking at here in the lesson for our class. Now, at the center of a rotating black hole, you have a ringularity. That's, again, a real term. Um, sounds, again, kind of like a 4.30 Friday afternoon sort of decision. But anyway, um, the ringularity it, with a rotating black hole, presumably you end up with a situation where the singularity is not a single point, but rather just an infinitely thin ring. Um, so that if you cross that ring, then you're going into the singularity. Of course, you're probably dead before then, but that, that's kind of what's going on here. Um, again, we're not going to get too much further into the gory details of that, as it were. But um, now we're going to look at a different way to classify our black holes. And this time we're looking at how to classify them based on their mass. And these are kind of like, if you know anything about boxing um, and prize fighting and so forth, you know about different weight classes for boxers, um, heavyweight, welterweight, bantamweight, all that stuff. These classification schemes for mass are kind of like that, but for black holes. And we're going to start with a stellar black hole or a stellar mass black hole. And these are kind of the main black holes that most people talk about and like every time we've mentioned black holes prior to this lesson, this has kind of been what we've been implying. We're talking about a stellar black hole and we call it a stellar black hole because you know, stellar means something to do with a star and stellar black holes are black holes that directly form out of stars, which again is what we've been discussing so far. And they have a, a fairly wide range of masses. Again, they have to be at least three solar masses because we know that in order to get a black hole from a star, the core of that star has to itself be at least three solar masses. So that's sort of the bare minimum mass range. Uh, some people, some of y'all were talking about this in the discussion post yesterday. And, but there's an upper limit too. Um, the, the biggest stellar black holes are going to, you know, cap at about 30 or so uh, solar masses. Beyond that, we start to say that, okay, well, no, they're probably going to be, um, in a different size class or mass class. Now, and again, old news, stellar black holes are gonna form from a type two supernova or maybe a hypernova, maybe the merger of two smaller stellar black holes. But again, their size is going to be, um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty small. Kind of like how neutron stars are only a few kilometers wide, again, maybe about 20 kilometers wide. A stellar mass black hole, which one example is given here, might be about as big as a small state like Rhode Island, it says it's about 37 miles or 60 kilometers across. So this one, again, would be about three times the radius of a, a pretty typical neutron star. So again, still a really tiny structure compared to a planet or a star, um, anything like that. And again, that's because we have to compress a star really, really small to make it into a black hole. So it makes sense that a stellar black hole would be relatively tiny. 
compared to the sun or especially to a giant star or whatever. Now, this next class is the intermediate class, and this is the one we know the least about. We actually don't really have any good confirmed examples of intermediate black holes you know, found somewhere in the universe, in our galaxy or outside of it. And their mass range, again, if you'll notice, the, this is a bit of a fudged mass range because we said it starts around 100 and the previous class ends at about 30. So a little bit of fudging there. But roughly about 100 to up to 100,000 solar mass uh, for the range of masses here. And that's a big range. And that's the reason why it's such a big range is because there's a big gap, again, in detected black holes. We, we, have, we know of a lot of black holes that have very small masses that we call stellar black holes. And we also know about some black holes that are really, 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 really massive, over 10,000 solar masses. But we don't really know of any that are kind of in this in-between range. And that's why this range is set with such a big, you know, um, difference between its minimum and maximum amounts. So uh, the best explanation we have for why we might have intermediate mass black holes, and there one is shown here, by the way, in the diagram, but the best explanation might be, again, through black hole mergers. If you have some really, really high-end stellar mass black holes, if they were to merge, like, say, like a 30 mass black hole, a 30 solar mass black hole, merging with another 30, maybe a little bit bigger, 35, I don't know, solar mass black hole, they would merge to make something even more massive, in that case around, well, 65. And if you if you keep having this process occur, then, well, maybe we get to the point where we have some of these intermediate mass black holes. And if you go and look up some of the uh, graphics that the LIGO and Virgo observatories have put out, they have some diagrams that literally show detections of some of these mergings. Um, so we do know that stellar black holes do merge into larger masses, but just maybe not as big of a mass as we would expect in this intermediate group yet. And like it says, these are pretty, these are, these would be bigger. If we do find an intermediate mass black hole, it's going to be of a significant size. If you find one, for example, with a mass of 10,000 solar masses, it would be several times the diameter of the earth. So, you know, the size of like a, a like a, a decent sized giant planet. Like this is roughly the size of Neptune, for example. Neptune's about this big. So pretty big for a black hole, but not as big as these. So we have now our super massive or as, uh, uh, Mr. DeMeo would say super massive black holes. And these gargantuan black holes are between 10,000 and roughly 10 billion with a B solar masses. And again, this is a, yet another huge range of mass. And that's because we have found some examples kind of near both ends of this range. Uh, some black holes we have detected for sure are incredibly massive. And some are still really massive too. They're just, you know, still measured in the tens or hundreds of thousands of solar masses instead of millions or billions of solar masses. So these, uh, if, if you've ever heard people talking about black holes at the center of a galaxy, this is what they're talking about. That's, and you can talk about supermassive black holes that might not be at the center of a galaxy, but that's a lot less common. We typically find them in black hole cores, or sorry, in galactic cores. And part of the reason why this might be the case is because in, in most galaxies in their cores, and we're going to talk more about this in the next unit, uh, they have a lot of older, larger stars, like red giants, red super giants, especially too. And so if, if they have a lot of those now, then, and these galaxies have existed for, you know, pretty long amounts of times, maybe they also had other um, super giant stars before that have also already gone through a type two supernova explosion where they've turned into smaller stellar black holes and those started to merge more and more and more with each other, eventually getting to the point where they're, they're now one of these huge supermassive black holes. That's sort of the basic explanation for why these might occur. And again, that could be wrong. There could be something else going on here. We don't know about yet, but they can, these, these black holes can actually rival the size of, some super giant stars. So these are still like none of these black holes are going to be bigger than the biggest normal stars, but they can they can start to go toe to toe with them. And again, you've got one example shown here. This is this is one that's shown at about four million solar masses, which is actually that's a good number to use because uh, that's actually roughly the mass of the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, and it's called Sagittarius A star. Um, and that's mentioned right here. This is another, uh, this, that's how you um, shorten the name. It's, it's listed as SGRA star. And that's a proposed depiction of what its accretion disk might look like if it has one. 
But again, it would be about as big as 17 times the diameter of the sun. So not necessarily the size of a super giant star in that case, but still definitely a giant star. Um, and um, again, the more massive the black hole would be, then it can actually truly become something to rival a, a super giant star. Um, very famous example from last year, almost a year ago, is the black hole M87 star. Sorry, I, I just I, I developed this habit of snapping my fingers to emphasize the little asterisk in their name. Um, and it's literally said star. That's like when you if you watch videos about this stuff, they'll say that they'll say M87 star. It's, uh, and they won't snap their fingers, but I do. I don't know. Just to have it. Um, but again, it, M87's black hole was really famous because that was the first imaged black hole from last year. And it was imaged with something called the Event Horizon Telescope, which was um, actually it's actually it's a collection or a networked group of big radio telescopes from all over the planet, several of them. And because they were working together, and this is a, a, a process called interferometry, um, not too different in concept compared to how the LIGO detector works. Um, the I in LIGO means interferometry. But they were able to basically, using these multiple radio telescopes, make pretty much a, a virtual radio dish pretty much the size of the Earth because these these radio telescopes were on all different parts of the planet. And with a virtual, if you will, radio dish that big, they could image the radio waves coming out of M87, which again, M87, that, the, M87 is another galaxy. It is not in the Milky Way. It's another separate galaxy. And it's pretty far away. So the fact that we are able to image one black hole, it's a super massive black hole, but one black hole in a distant galaxy using our technology as of the year you know, 2019 is pretty impressive. And again, of course, the famous image is right here. And um, what you're seeing there is the orangey stuff. First of all, it's not really orange. Again, this is a visual representation of radio waves coming out of the black hole. So, and, and, but the orange represents the, the very hot material of, of the accretion disk around the black hole. And then the dark spot in the center represents the limits of the event horizon, the, um, the Schwarzschild radius. Okay, and so anyway, um, M87 star, that black hole, has a mass of 6.5 billion solar masses, which is tremendous. Whereas, again, Sagittarius A star only has about 4 million, with an M, solar masses. Um, oh, and I forgot to take that little bit out of that uh, bullet point there, but that's the next part. So again, if you've seen Interstellar, um, Gargantua is the name of the black hole in that movie, and it is also a supermassive black hole. Now, unlike the ones we've been talking about, uh, Gargantua is not presented as a supermassive black hole that is at the center of a galaxy. Instead, it's basically at the center of its own little solar system. It's surrounded by orbiting planets, um, and they go to a couple of these planets in the movie. But um, it's, it's rated at about 100 million solar masses, the black hole is, and its radius is about the same as the distance of the Earth from the sun, Earth's orbit. And uh, that would mean one AU or one astronomical unit. <clears throat> now, and again, with Interstellar, it really popularized this particular image we now have in our minds of a black hole. And um, even before it did that, you would still see a lot of depictions, artistic depictions, like you see down here on the bottom right, of black holes with these large disks around them, these accretion disks that we've been talking about. And the reason why these disks can form is because if, if a bunch of matter is trying to be absorbed by the black hole all at once, it, it can't all just go in at the same time. Uh, it's similar to how we, we kind of talked about how like right now the earth isn't falling directly toward the sun. It's orbiting the sun. Similarly, matter is going to orbit a black hole and it might have a decaying orbit where it spirals inward toward the black hole, but that's a process and it takes some time. And the more matter that's trying to do this, they kind of get in each other's way. It kind of clogs the drain as it will, as you were, or as you, if you will, I don't even know how to say the phrase. Um, but it's kind of like water trying to funnel down a drain in your sink or your bathtub. And at, you know, more and more matter, um, crowded together, hitting each other at high velocities. It's going to cause a lot of friction and heat to build up. And so you get a lot of high frequency electromagnetic energy radiated away from the accretion disk. 
that's actually one way that we were able to find x-rays to begin with. And again, the black hole apocalypse video gets into this when it discusses the black hole Cygnus X1. We didn't know about that black hole except for the fact that it was emitting x-rays due to its accretion disk. And so these accretion disks actually help us find black holes they, because it's kind of like a, it's kind of like if you had someone, you know, and I'll just use a personal experience here, but if you were outside, you know, running around playing tag as a kid, hide and seek at night or something, which I've done, you know, once upon a time, um, you know, if you're, if you're dressed all in black or something at night, you're going to be tough to spot and hide in the shadows and all that. But if uh, someone comes up and puts, you know, a, uh, a little, uh, light on you or makes you hold a flashlight, well, you're going to be pretty easily spotted. Similarly, a black hole by itself can't really be seen, but if it's decorated, if you will, by this accretion disk, well, it'll be hard to miss. Um, and if the black hole is very massive, again, like a supermassive black hole, and it's also active, meaning it's consuming a lot of matter, um, a lot of the energy is actually going to escape the accretion disk. It's not going to escape the black hole. You know, we're not talking about energy crossing the event horizon and getting back out, but a lot of the energy will escape the accretion disk perpendicular to it in what we call relativistic jets or polar jets because they, they align themselves to the black hole's magnetic north and south poles. And we don't really talk about magnetic fields for black holes, but they do have magnetic fields. And, um, and this, again, we've seen, we've seen similar jets before when talking about the jets coming out of a protostar's accretion disk or even forming out of the uh, accretion disk that develop in a hypernova or kilonova. And honestly, all that is it. So I'm going to exit presentation mode. And we have finished our... Sorry, trying to find the best way to do this. So I'm going to stop presenting. And we finished our black hole lesson. And so that actually means that's the end of our new material for this unit. Again, we are going to be testing next week online, um, most likely on Friday at this point and uh you'll have some some different assignments next week that'll help kind of give you just some practice over this all of this information from this week and you'll also get you know some some review assignments as well and uh i'll talk more in the announcement posts about what you can expect from the test um but i'll just i'll say this for now that if you did turn in your project and you worked on it um then you'll be in pretty good shape for the test because um, we've covered a lot of material and since the project gave us one way to assess your knowledge from this unit, um, I think we can. Uh, I think it's fair to to have this test maybe only assess some of the more recent information we've gone over. But again, more details about that to come. All right, and y'all have a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday. <laughs>